In a single, thunderous move that sent shockwaves through the global economy, China struck a blow that Washington never saw coming. With zero warning and absolute authority, Beijing issued a directive that all Chinese companies must immediately cease purchases of American-made semiconductors. Overnight, the critical pipeline of U.S. chips flowing into China's sprawling tech sector was severed. The silence that followed wasn't calm. It was the eerie quiet before a financial storm. In D.C., the fallout was instant. Scott Besant, the former Wall Street heavyweight now serving as U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, was reportedly blindsided, staring down a scenario that threatened to derail the very core of America's tech-driven economic engine. This wasn't just about chips. It was about power. It was about sovereignty. And for Donald Trump, who believed he had played his cards perfectly, it was the unraveling of a plan he once believed foolproof. His administration had loosened restrictions, crafting a tailored deal that would allow NVIDIA to sell its newly designed H20 artificial intelligence chips to China. A chip created with just enough capability to be valuable, but just enough restraint to pass U.S. export laws. From Washington's vantage point, it was a masterstroke. Let China buy a limited version of American tech. Let U.S. companies feast on profits, and let the government scoop 15% from every transaction. It was, in theory, effortless income. A stream of capital flowing into America while keeping China tethered to its silicon leash. But Beijing didn't blink. It didn't even hesitate. Instead, it slammed the door shut with surgical precision. Not only were NVIDIA's chips rejected, but the Chinese government delivered a sweeping order. All purchases from American chipmakers, including AMD, were to be cancelled immediately. Two of the United States' largest semiconductor firms cut off in a single moment. And then, Beijing drove the message even deeper with a second blow. New regulations were rolled out, banning American chips from any government-funded projects across the country. This wasn't a negotiation tactic. This was a statement of intent. China was no longer playing defense. It was asserting dominance, signaling to the world that it would not be cornered, manipulated, or controlled by American technology. The H-20 chip, deliberately crippled to comply with U.S. law, was seen by Beijing not as a compromise, but as an insult. Paying premium prices for a neutered product while funding the U.S. Treasury was not partnership, it was dependency by design. A humiliating toll booth on the road to progress. And so China opted out. But the consequences of that decision are far from confined to a few tech contracts. What just happened threatens to upend the very architecture of global technology supply chains. For decades, American chipmakers thrived in China, pocketing billions from one of the largest and fastest growing markets on the planet. Without those buyers, revenue forecasts are collapsing. Stock prices are trembling. Long-term leadership in cutting-edge AI, high-performance computing, and next-generation hardware is now in question. And all of this is hitting just as the U.S. economy teeters under the weight of ballooning national debt, stubborn inflation, and growing political instability. Losing China right now is like yanking a critical beam from a crumbling structure. It's not just risky, it's catastrophic. And make no mistake, this is not simply about trade. This is a full-scale contest for technological and geopolitical supremacy. And at this moment, Beijing looks steady, strategic, and unbothered, while Washington stumbles through the consequences of its own miscalculations. But this collapse wasn't born overnight. It was years in the making, a slow build of policy after policy all aimed at keeping China locked out of the semiconductor elite. For more than a decade, U.S. administrations, Democratic and Republican alike, tightened export rules, blocked access to advanced chip designs, withheld critical manufacturing tools, and tried to starve China of the resources it needed to compete in artificial intelligence, supercomputing, and other frontier technologies. The goal? Keep the dragon in the cage. If China couldn't get the fastest chips, it couldn't win the race. But while Washington was busy crafting restrictions, Beijing was busy building an empire. It funneled tens of billions into its domestic semiconductor ecosystem, created vast industrial zones dedicated to chip production, expanded engineering programs at its universities, and backed a wave of startups and national champions aimed at breaking foreign dependence, bit by bit, wafer by wafer. Progress was uneven at first. Skeptics in Washington scoffed. Analysts predicted it would take a decade or more for China to catch up. But that timeline was wishful thinking. What was supposed to take 10 years sometimes took 5. In some domains it happened even faster. Then came the trade war. And with it the spark. Tariffs. Sanctions. Chip bans. One restriction after another. Each meant to hobble China's momentum. But instead of slowing, Beijing accelerated. Each penalty became motivation. Each blockade became a challenge. What was once a long-term vision became a short-term mission. China stopped merely trying to catch up. 
it began sprinting toward independence. And as Beijing gained speed, Washington started to feel the blowback. American firms were bleeding. NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Intel, giants with deep stakes in the Chinese market, watched revenues shrink. Entire product lines were suddenly at risk. Political pressure mounted. Something had to give. So Trump recalibrated. The H20 chip was designed to be the off-ramp. A version of advanced AI hardware weak enough to get US approval, but strong enough to tempt Chinese buyers. Add a 15% tax to the deal, and you've got a politically saleable package. Profits for corporations, a windfall for the treasury, and a thinly veiled show of control. Except China wasn't interested in playing that game anymore. Beijing not only refused the deal, it dismantled it. Orders were cancelled. Guidance was issued. Chips were blacklisted. And while this was unfolding, China was quietly launching its own alternatives. Homegrown AI systems like DeepSeek began hitting the market. Robust, scalable, and shockingly competitive. Its debut sent a chill through Silicon Valley. It was undeniable proof that China was no longer waiting on America's technology. It was building its own, and it was catching up. And in that moment, Washington's strategy was laid bare. The H-20 wasn't a gift, it was a trap. A downgraded product, sold at a premium, taxed by the US, and packaged as partnership. But Beijing saw it for what it was, dependency with strings attached. And it refused to be strung along any longer. So China made its move. Not with speeches, not with threats, but with a cold, calculated cut. And in doing so, it didn't just reject a deal. It rejected an entire era of American tech dominance. They hit the brakes on US chip imports with force and didn't try to keep it quiet. It was a deliberate, strategic performance. China putting the world on notice. To Washington, the message couldn't be clearer. The era of Chinese tech firms depending on American processors is coming to an end. And to the rest of the world, the statement was even bolder. China isn't just resisting pressure, it's stepping out with confidence, ready to build its future on its own terms. This wasn't just about banning a chip. It wasn't about one product or one company. It was a signal of something deeper, a fundamental shift in the balance of power in global technology. For the United States, it's a wake-up call. A sign that the strategy of cutting China off from advanced chips might be nearing its limit. For China, it's a turning point. A chance to prove that decades of investment in homegrown tech and infrastructure are beginning to bear fruit. And when we talk about US tech's dependence on China, we're not talking about a niche market or a convenient supply chain. We're talking about a core pillar of the global tech economy. An industrial and consumer base so vast and essential that losing access to it could disrupt the financial foundations of the biggest companies on earth. Take Apple. China has long been both one of Apple's biggest markets and its most critical manufacturing hub. In 2023, nearly 19% of Apple's global revenue, almost $15 billion, came from Greater China. But that number only tells half the story. It's not just about iPhones sold in Beijing or Shanghai. It's about the supply chains running through Shenzhen, the factories churning out millions of devices on tight schedules and the logistics networks that make Apple's global operations tick. If China decides to close doors, Apple doesn't just face falling sales, it faces production chaos, and the scope is unmistakable. Outside of the US, China is home to more Apple stores than anywhere else in the world. Then there's NVIDIA, the face of America's AI boom. In 2022, about a quarter of its data center revenue came from China. AI labs, cloud companies, and research institutions across the country were placing massive GPU orders. But then came the export controls. NVIDIA was forced to produce watered-down chips like the A800 and H20, stripped of their most advanced capabilities, just to keep shipping something. But even that might not be enough. Analysts estimate that full access to China could have brought in an additional $15 billion. Now that revenue is gone, possibly for good. Qualcomm is even more exposed. Its chips are the beating heart of smartphones from Chinese giants like Xiaomi, Oppo, and Vivo. In 2023, 64% of Qualcomm's total revenue came from China. And those chips aren't just sold domestically, they power devices exported all over the world. Lose that volume and Qualcomm doesn't just lose revenue, it loses the scale needed to fund the r and amp. D, that keeps it globally competitive. Even companies not focused on physical tech are feeling the impact. Microsoft earns billions in China through enterprise software, Windows licenses, and its Azure cloud services, often delivered through local partnerships and joint ventures. Then there's Tesla. While it's not a tech company in the traditional sense, it lives and breathes innovation. And it relies on China in a major way. 
The Shanghai Gigafactory produces hundreds of thousands of EVs every year, many sold domestically. If access to China tightens, the ripple effects won't just hit sales, they'll strike at the company's core manufacturing operations. What links all these companies is not just their exposure to China, it's the scale China provides. We're talking about hundreds of millions of middle-class consumers, state-backed mega-projects, and industrial clients placing orders at a scale few other countries can even imagine. That scale isn't just profitable, it enables innovation. It funds the development of next-gen products. It makes once-impossible technologies commercially viable. And yet, while U.S. political rhetoric around decoupling is growing louder, the data tells a different story. For America's largest tech firms, China isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. If Beijing were to cut off full access, the fallout wouldn't just be an inconvenience. It would be an earthquake. Revenues would plummet, supply chains would snap, and Wall Street would feel it in real time. Now enter Scott Besant, not just another Wall Street name. Besant is a hedge fund billionaire who made his fortune by understanding global markets, and then pivoted into politics as a key economic advisor under Trump. Today, as Treasury Secretary, he finds himself at the epicenter of this tech war. And according to insiders, Besant may not be fully on board with Washington's hardline approach. He understands the stakes. He knows that every lost order to NVIDIA, Qualcomm, or Intel represents billions in vanishing revenue. And as the person responsible for steering the U.S. economy through turbulence, he's facing a challenge that monetary policy alone can't fix. Some say Besant has quietly explored back channels, possibly even reopening communication with Beijing, to reduce the pressure and find a way forward. But the damage may already be done. Once a move like China's chip ban happens, trust fractures. It doesn't matter if a deal is made tomorrow. Chinese companies will now think twice before ever depending on American tech again. This isn't about one shipment or one executive decision. It's about the architecture of global trade realigning in real time. And it's not just semiconductors. These chips power everything. Phones, cars, cloud servers, hospital equipment, defense systems. If China designs an ecosystem where American chips aren't needed, where every software update, every hardware integration, every innovation is built on domestic or non-US technology, the entire industry starts shifting. The U.S. doesn't just lose business. It loses leverage. It loses its central position in the global tech order. That influence, built over decades, was rooted in America's leadership in semiconductors. Now, with one sweeping decision, Beijing is testing just how deep that influence really runs. And across the U.S., manufacturers are already feeling the squeeze. The parts they rely on, the specialized equipment, precision tools, raw materials, are suddenly more expensive, more delayed and more uncertain. What used to be a smooth, reliable flow of goods has turned into a trickle, choked by red tape, higher costs, and geopolitical tension. On factory floors, the pain is immediate. Orders are slowing. Shifts are shrinking. Some lines are going dark. Managers are forced to cut hours or shut down operations just to survive. What was sold to the American worker as a manufacturing comeback now looks more like a last stand. And this isn't just about the U.S.-China dynamic. The broader trade war has started to strain alliances. Long-standing partners in Europe, Asia, and beyond are questioning the stability of their economic ties with Washington. Tariff threats. Policy flip-flops. Diplomatic uncertainty. These signals are pushing allies to explore alternatives. And increasingly, they're doing just that. Quietly building new trade blocks, financial systems, and partnerships designed to work without American involvement. Once those systems mature, the U.S. won't be able to simply reassert dominance. The world will have options, real ones. And the longer this goes on, the harder it will be for Washington to regain control. That's the real cost, not just missed opportunities or temporary losses, but the irreversible erosion of global influence. So as U.S. officials chase short-term wins, blocking chips here, imposing tariffs there, the rest of the world is constructing a new economic reality. The threat isn't just that costs are rising today. It's that tomorrow, the world may no longer need America to keep everything running. And once that realization sets in, U.S. leverage won't just diminish, it could disappear. The question now isn't whether the global system is changing. It is. The real question is whether Washington understands how fast that change is happening, and whether it has any tools left to shape what comes next.